on the hillside that overlooks life's scene. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might see. ship would be no more. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. For Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin around us says tear that lighthouse down the big ships don't sail this way anymore there's no use of it standing round then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time I saw stands up there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. For Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, Good morning. Glad to have each and every one of you here with us this morning. It is a great day outside. It is a great day inside. And I'm excited to be here this morning, and we're going to look at uh, God's Word together. But it's been a great week. i tell you what, it is wonderful to come and be able to know that God is at work. And I don't think we can put too much emphasis on that. Sometimes we, we just get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, and I'll tell you what, we've had some interesting experiences this week and seeing God provide in a great way. And uh, just, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about God's guidance, but just to sit back when a week has passed and look back and see, well, I couldn't have planned that, I couldn't have planned that, and God took care of that, and it was all just according to His will. And I hope that that is a blessing that you've been able to experience this week if there is an opportunity for you to stop and to meditate and to stop and think sometime during the week of what God has done for you, I'll tell you what, it's, it's one of the greatest ways that you can just kind of check up on your relationship with God and be able to give Him the thanks that is due Him and the honor for what He's doing in our lives. 
it's easy in life to get caught up in what's going on around us. And we have to realize that the God who is over us is in control of what's around us. And so what, a, what an opportunity to come together today and to kind of think back over a week and to prepare for next week. There's another week coming and God has even more in store for us. And there's change in the air. Things are definitely changing and at a faster rate than maybe what we're accustomed to seeing. But God is in control of that change as well, is He not? And so what an opportunity. I pray that if you're here this morning or you're listening this morning, that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. That you know for sure that if you died today, it would be an opportunity for you to be in God's presence. And sometimes in the middle of hard times, we fail to remind people of that opportunity. That God loves them, God sent His Son to die on the cross, and to forgive you of the sins that you've committed. And the Bible tells us that plainly. But there's always light in the world. Sometimes it seems to darken a bit, but the light always shines through. And so this morning we're going to look at the importance of God in your life. It's interesting to talk to people and to gain their perspective on their, their viewpoint of where God exists in their life. You'll have some people say flat out, I don't believe in God. There's not a God. If there was a God, why would all of these things be happening? Why would this be going on in our world today? And as I've said many other times, I can't answer all of those questions. I don't know. I don't think any of us do. But God does. And God has a time frame and a plan. And God is real. But there are those who say God isn't real. There are some who would have to say God himself is real, but I don't see the reality of him in my life. And for those people, life can sometimes seem darker than to others. Because there's an opportunity to look at life and what surrounds us and to be influenced by how it impacts us as individuals. There was a recent Gallup poll. According to it, when the question was asked, what is the most important thing in your life? Stop and think just for a minute. What is the most important thing in your life? 73% said work was the most important. How do you think that's working out right now? A lot of people have gotten a surprise, haven't they? The job that they counted on, we know of one family who shared with us that they had a fairly comfortable income and they had built their lifestyle around the income. Guess what happened? The jobs were lost. The income was lost. The lifestyle is going to have to change a bit. 70% said friends ranked next. Higher than money, higher than religion. Work and friends. Does that sound like something that you want to pin your hopes on today? Because as you're seeing, in the midst of all of this, not only work is being sacrificed, but you begin to find out who your friends are, don't you? Sometimes the situations that we face in life have an ever-broadening, ever-deepening scope of impact on our life. You will notice that your friends will either become much closer to you, much more encouraging to you, or they might just decide they've got enough issues of their own that they're going to deal with those. The Bible says that as a Christian, we have a friend who sticketh closer than a brother. And it's a great thing to know that as we go through our life, the Christ is always there. God is always there for us, stable and true. Turn over, if you will, to Psalm chapter 86. Psalm 86. You know, many people are either enduring this world or they're simply existing in it. They're either enduring this world or they're simply existing in it. They're not living in this world. What brings life to your existence today? Because as we've discussed in weeks past and as we notice what is going on in our world today, if you're not counting on something stable life will never stabilize. You will find yourself in this description that I just gave, 
of either enduring or simply existing. Is that the type of life that we can live right now? Unfortunately, it is the life that many are living because they don't know what else to do. They have no options. Things are falling apart around them. And they're simply content right now to say, I guess I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Some even say, I don't want to get through this. Enough is enough. I'm done. I'm going to find some way to deal with this. Psalm 86.10 says, For thou art great, and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Define God alone in your life today. Are you able to say with confidence as David did, He is God. Many can say He is God. Satan knows that there's a God. And he knows that He is the God. But can you with confidence say He is God alone? He is God alone Period. But more than that, He is God alone in my life. When I have to define, if I were to take a poll, what the most important thing in my life is, it would be God. God is God alone and He is priority in my life. When you're looking at your life, are you content to simply look at your life? Or are you content more to look at how God is working in your life. Many times you can drive around a city and you can see in the neighborhoods varying stages of housing. Some, it's fairly obvious that nobody's lived there in a while. And then you might even see somebody's head pop out of there and they actually do live there. So, not inhabited, not in good repair, some that are working on it, and you can tell there's new things going up, new landscaping going down. And then there are those who have already done all the work, and it's a nice place. You can tell that there's a priority in what they're trying to accomplish. And you can tell by that neighborhood that there is a work in progress. Our lives may not be perfect, but do you notice someone working in your life? Do you have a desire to see someone work in your life, to do something great, to return joy, to bring peace, to bring comfort? God alone can do all of those things. But where is the desire? When you look at what people's desire is, they fail often to look at God's greatness. When you gain a glimpse of God's greatness, you're going to gain a broader understanding of what that greatness can mean in your life. Many people might say, oh, God's great. How many times do we take the opportunity to say, here's how God proved himself great in my life this week? Here are the attributes of God where I see His greatness. How many times do we share with other people, you know, I serve a great God. Let me tell you about the God that loved me enough to save me from my sins, to make a way for me to spend my eternity in heaven. Let me tell you just how great that God is. Not only should we look at God's greatness, but we can see God's goodness in our lives. And you can see God's willingness to demonstrate that goodness in your life. But again, the question comes down to a practical one. How do I define God's goodness in my life? Turn over, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. God's goodness is demonstrated by His grace. And when you look in Romans chapter 6, you'll see that it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. One of the reasons that people don't see God's goodness 
nor God's greatness is the fact that sin has dominion in their life. It is sin, some aspect of sin that they have said, this is what's more important to me than God. You begin to look at how people are dealing with what's around them. But so many times there's some aspect of their life where if you told them sin has dominion over you, they would throw up their hands in a hurry and say, no, no, no. Nothing has dominion over me. But how many times are people sin running their lives? How many times do you see someone being impacted by the sin in their life? Or their family being impacted by the sin in their life? It's hard to see God's goodness when sin is paramount. Notice that sometimes sin can have a temporary satisfaction. You notice I said temporary. And you may wonder, well, shouldn't you be saying that sin doesn't have any satisfaction? Sin does for a season. And Satan will make it look good. And the way that that comes to play in our lives in times like we see now is that Satan says, life is too dreary to look at it for what it is. Life holds no comfort. Life holds no joy. Life just isn't any fun anymore. Let's get your mind off of all of that. And and let me give you something to to think on or, or some activity to do or whatever it might be. And he blurs the lines of your vision because the question can easily come up, if, if God is so good and God is so gracious, why is my world falling apart? Do you know some people like that right now? Who are struggling? Who are fearful? Who have concerns? And they're often hiding it with activity. If I have to sit around my house and look and think, then it's just too much. So I'm just going to keep myself busy. And Satan lets them begin to think, hey, I can can have pleasure in whatever this is that I'm doing. When you begin to look at how people are responding, what was one of the first things that people wanted to get back to? There were some that felt the need to get back to church had the desire to go and worship again. But you know the number one destination people wanted to get back to? The beach. Have you seen the pictures? Have you seen the video? Was the priority about life, the integrity, the importance of life, or was it about the importance of pleasure? It doesn't mean that we can't have pleasure, that we can't enjoy a time of vacation. But Satan is going to put it out there and say, hey, look at what we can do with ourselves now. And people can begin to think of things more important than that relationship with God. Too many people are dissatisfied with life because of their temporary satisfaction. But it's interesting to hear people say they won't give God control of their lives, that nothing will control them. But if you ask them what drives them, oftentimes you will see exactly what controls them. If someone were to ask you today, what is the driving force in your life? Would your answer be, it's my relationship with God? It's important to me more than anything else to see God's greatness exhibited in my life. You see, sin breeds disdain. Sin breeds despair. Sin breeds deceit. And reality is so difficult for many people because Satan is deceiving. And we can sit and we can look and we can see from God's Word the direction that often we need to take. Psalm 31, verse 19. 
But Satan likes to pose questions in people's minds about God's greatness and about God's goodness. If God is so great, why hasn't he fixed the world that you live in? If God is so good to you, why are you facing all the guidelines that you're facing? Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Not only is it God's greatness and his goodness, but the important aspect of God in your life today is also God's guidance. Because often what drives us guides us. If, if work drives you, then it's going to be, here's my commitment to work. Here's what I've got to do, especially in these days, it, it becomes a bit more of a rat race in some aspects. I have to do this because if I don't, I might lose my job. If they require this of me, then I've just got to do it because I don't want to risk not having employment. If we contrast that to what God has asked us to do in our lives, how willing are we to do that? Isn't it amazing what we're willing to do to see some physical reciprocation? But when we look at what God would have us to do in our lives, are we that willing? Is it important enough to us to say that, God, I want you to be God alone in my life. I trust and I believe through faith that because you are God alone in my life, that you're also going to guide me. What a demonstration of his goodness and his greatness. Look at Joseph. If Joseph could have complained, he would have had a right to in our eyes, wouldn't he? A lot of people are blaming their current setting in life on circumstances. Well, let's just take a real quick, brief look at Joseph. His father was a con artist. His mother died when he was young. He lived in the middle of a dysfunctional family. Could there be a possibility that someone lives in a life like that today? A lot of people live in dysfunctional settings, don't they? So what is the remedy for that? Because some could say, I'm stuck. Look at where I am. There's nothing I can do. We're in the midst of all of this crisis. I can't control any of that. What you can control is the role of God in your life. Is there a desire to have God work in your life? Or to so many, is it simply just something that sounds good? When people are now saying, I want to worship, what does that really mean to them? The word in and of itself, worship, does that mean that I want God to be God alone in my life and I'm going to worship Him for the God that He is? Or am I going to worship God in some way that I've created that works for me? That falls short of what God would define as worship. It doesn't do any good to go supposedly worship God for a little while on Sunday morning and then go back to life as usual any time following that. In other words, constantly adjusting God in your level of priorities. I need to do this because God's important. Instead of I need to do all of this because God is the important factor in my life. When God is in control of your life, it's no longer a mere existence it could be described as sheer exuberance. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. In the times when you feel weak, when the times come that are difficult, what an opportunity to sit back and just with everything that's in your heart, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It almost makes you want to bust out in song, doesn't it? Because when you realize the importance of having God as a priority in your life, Life itself will change. One of the things we need to realize is to have the mind of Christ. When the mind of Christ is active in your life, 
when your desire is to have God first and foremost, then it's a little easier to be keenly aware that God's guiding you. I was talking to one of my brothers this week, and they have been traveling. And they went to Carlsbad Caverns, and I was sharing this with some friends yesterday. One of the rooms in there is a mile long. Countless stories in the earth, a mile long. Have you ever been in a cave when they turned out the lights? You just thought you saw dark until you got in the cave, didn't you? And what things begin to happen when they decide to turn out the lights? Now remember, you have a guide who took you to now what is a place of darkness. You see, everything's good when you can see the guide up there. When there's light all along the path. And when movement is underway. But when you come to a standstill in the light and you encounter darkness, even though you know where you stand, it becomes a question, doesn't it? What was that I just felt run across my foot? Are, are, are you still there, that, that person that came with you? Is there a bat getting ready to land on my shoulder who thinks I'm a part of the wall and is just going to sit there and I hope that he's gone when the light comes on. But doesn't the darkness seem to begin to weigh heavy? And you feel the weight of the darkness. You know, that's a great picture of life. What happens if they never turn the light back on? If you never see the guide again? If now it is your responsibility to get out of the circumstance that you find yourself in, in total darkness, without guidance, without direction, just dumped you in the middle of a cave and said, find your own way out. What would you think? Is this possible? Can I find my way out? Will I ever see light again? You know, even a match in the middle of darkness seems like a lot of light. The faintest of breeze in the midst of darkness seems to be a bit refreshing. Do you know how many people are living their life today in total darkness? Without anyone to turn to for guidance? And experiencing those same fears. What if I never get out of this? What if this is my life for the rest of the time that I'm here on earth? May I remind you it's not just about your time on earth. Because the Bible says in Matthew 8, 12, it speaks of outer darkness, which is hell, that will last for eternity. If you think that you're scared of the dark now, imagine eternity in that same type of darkness. And there will be no guide, and there will be no way out and there will be no second chances. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You ask, how do I gain the guidance of God in my life? First is by salvation. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven of those sins. I understand that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for me. But then comes the test. Satan will tempt you day in and day out. He'll make things look attractive that you don't need to have any part of. He'll make things look less like sin than they should. But because of that relationship with God, when you have God as God alone in your life, you are able to say, I can resist the devil. I can resist temptation. Maybe not in and of just myself, but God will fight for me. That's the importance of having God, not just His greatness, not just His goodness, but His guidance. Think of yourself back in that cave again. How eager are you for those lights to come back on, to see that guide? Does it matter how far up that guide is? 
Your confidence is in the fact that He knows where you were in the dark. He knows where the path should go. And He knows that as long as you follow Him, it's going to be all right. Are you willing to trust in God more than you would trust that guide in a dark cave? Turn over, if you will, to Psalms 25. Psalms 25. David said in verse 15, My eyes are ever toward the Lord. Does that sound like God is his priority? That God is God alone in the life of David? He says, My eyes are ever toward the Lord. There's a question for us right here. Where are your eyes today? What are you looking at? What have you pointed your focus toward? What is the most important thing to you right now? What have you focused your eyes on? For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Verse 16, turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. David got a good glimpse of himself. Here's how I feel. Lord, here's what's important to me. Here's where I am right now. When God is the priority in your life, you can share those innermost feelings. You can have the confidence of the fellowship that says, God, here's what I'm feeling right now. I need you. I need you to understand. I need your goodness. I need your greatness. I need you to guide me from this place where I find myself. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Are the troubles of your heart enlarged today? Does life and the things of life seem to be overwhelming right now? Do you find yourself fearful for those that you love? We had a friend who lost a father this week. Do you think that's a difficult thing? It's kind of an obvious answer, isn't it? It wasn't planned. Do you think that their hearts are weighed down? So when that situation comes, unplanned, unannounced, are we able with confidence to simply look at God who is God alone and say, here's how I feel. And Lord, this is a feeling I can't put into words, but it's how I feel and I can't deal with this on my own. You see, too many people are trying to figure out how to deal with their life on their own. How to create their own guide. How to create their own darkness. Their own answer to darkness but the lights that they are using will simply dim. Are you looking for the guide this morning? Are you looking for the fact that you can rely on His greatness? David says, look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Part of understanding that in order to have God in a place where He is everything in your life, you have to realize exactly who you are. We tend to want to shine up things that don't shine, to paint things that aren't real pretty, to dress things up and make them look nice. When we look at ourselves, we have to realize that God's the only one that can shine us up. That can do what needs to be done in our life. To forgive us of those sins that we continue to commit. But the question I'll leave you with this morning is this. Is God important in your life? Do you know how many people could answer that yes without flinching? Oh, well, yeah, pastor. God, God's important in my life. Shouldn't God be important in everybody's life? But the true question is, 
How important is God in your life? Is He important enough for you to say, I can't do this anymore? Is He important enough for you to say, there's a change that needs to be made and it's time that that change is made? Is He important enough for you to maybe have to say, I had my priorities in the wrong place. You see, because if I had to answer who was the most important person in my life, I would, I would have to honestly say it was me. I wanted what I want. I wanted to do it when I wanted to do it. And I wanted all the satisfaction of doing it. What if the driving force in our life became having God alone as God alone in our life? And all of the decisions that I make, all of the plans that I make, all of the actions of my everyday life are but for one purpose. To serve God. I'm going to put others first. I'm going to love others in a way that God would love them. I'm going to demonstrate His greatness, His goodness, and His guidance in my life. And by that, people are going to be able to come to me and say, you're different. There's something about you that's different. Can you tell me what that is? How many people would say, oh, well, I've done this, and I've changed this, and, you know, sometimes you hear people go, did... Did you get your nails done? Did you get a new hairdo? Are those new glasses? Have you lost some weight? You love it when people ask you that, don't you? But they're looking for something different. They're inquisitive enough to ask you what that is. What if you could say, you know, everything's just the same. No, I haven't lost any weight. Still the same old glasses. I did wash my hair this morning. But I'll tell you what the difference is. I put God first in my life. I quit worrying about my job. I quit worrying about my friends. I kept worrying, quit worrying about whether I was going to get sick or not. I quit worrying about this, that, and the other. And I just said, God, you're great. And you're so good to me. And thank you for your grace. And Lord, I just want you to keep guiding me day by day. We're not going to be perfect. But when we put the one who, isn't, who is perfect in his proper place in our life, it gives us a guide to follow. We just got to keep getting back up and going forward. And I will tell you that your existence will not merely be an existence. It will be a joyous occasion that you call life. We don't know how much longer we have. Remember those unannounced and unexpected losses. Satan would have us to set our mind on worrying about all of those things. In closing, let's do one little mathematical skill test. It's easy, don't get worried. Would you rather deal with one thing or 50 things that were difficult? One easy thing versus 50 difficult things. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? The one thing that you have to deal with is saying, God, are you priority in my life? And after that, all of the other things that you would have had to deal with, you don't have to feel the weight of all of those. Why is that? God, you see that problem over there? A couple days ago, I would have wanted to deal with that problem. And let me tell you how I would have dealt with that problem. I, I would have stood up under the load and taken the burden by the tail. 
And then I'd have found me a corner and sat down and worried about it. And then I would have gone away discouraged because I couldn't fix the problem. I didn't have the ability to control the situation. But see, Lord, that was a couple days ago, and then I put you first in my life. And now I know, like when David said, I'm, I'm afflicted. My heart is enlarged. I'm overwhelmed. So, Lord, that problem over there and the ones that are all lined up behind it, can I ask you to help me with those? Can I help by putting you first in my life? Because, Lord, I realize that you are the greatest. I realize the expanse of your goodness. And Lord, there are still some problems lined up behind it, but I just need you to guide me through. You know, sometimes it's nice to be able to follow. There are a lot of people in charge who wish that no matter how much the people envy their position of what they deem to be that cushy job because you're in charge, it comes with some weight. And sometimes it's best to be able to step back and say, you know, I don't have to be in charge of this part. And that is the joy of having God first in your life. God, I got one thing to worry about. Are you number one in my life? I don't want to deal with Satan's complications. I don't want to deal with the long lines of, of trials and tribulations and temptations that Satan wants me to stand and stare at. You stand in those lines right now outside of a store and what do, you, what do you feel? Hot. Bored. A little frustrated. And if you concentrate on how long the line is, the weight just gets worse, doesn't it? But you see, I know some people who like to talk. And you find somebody in that line to talk to, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you're right up there ready to go in. Can I tell you this morning that no matter how long that line is, God is always there for you to talk to. And that line of trials and temptations, it may not get much shorter. They may always be there. But you have a guide who loves you and has the ability to take you through those problems. Are you willing to do that this morning? Has there been a time in your life where you realized that you were trying to guide yourself through life and it just wasn't working out real well? Maybe you were even doing all the right things, but it just didn't seem to end up the way it should. Can I encourage you this morning, put God where he needs to be in your life. Because when you put God where he needs to be in your life, I can promise you one thing, your life will change. Hope it's been an encouragement to you this morning. Take a moment, if you will, and bow your heads. And consider what we have heard this morning. Where is God at in your life? What is God doing in your life? How are you handling letting God be in charge of your life? And most importantly of all, has there ever been a time when you gave God complete control of your life? Because just as sin impacts others around you, so will your decision to make God first in your life. I can't express to you the importance of putting God first in your life today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to know that we can count on you. No matter how difficult life is, no matter how difficult it seems or the, the horizon seems to be, we know that you're in charge. 
And Lord, we rest in that fact. And we just pray for each and every one that has heard your word this morning that would impact their heart in a way that they would see their need of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We uh, hope that it's been a blessing to you. And I know that God's word will always come through in our time of need. Tossed by the billows on life's troubled sea, without an anchor, there was no hope for me. Forever drifting, forever lost, till a new hope was offered on an old. can see is this trial hanging like a cloud over you 